So uh, thank you very much to Xi'an for a, a really interesting talk that um, allowed uh, an exposition and an interrogation of a discourse which she evocatively described as sometimes at odds with itself. And uh, in our grappling with responding to this, it's possibly even causing us to, to question what makes us human. Um, but to help us continue this conversation and answer this question, I'd like to invite members of our panel to come up and take the stage and take a seat here. Um, there might be another microphone we could get, actually. Um, so, I'll just, while we're waiting for that, I'll just briefly introduce our panel. Um, we've got Catherine Cronin from uh, National University of Ireland, Galway. We've got um, Dr. Conor Galvin, who's uh, from UCD and the president of the Educational Studies Association of Ireland. And just like to congratulate Conor on behalf of everyone, just to embarrass him uh, on his Teaching Hero Award, which is, as people know him, is very richly deserved. and Charlotte Holland, Associate Dean of Research in the DCU Institute of Education. So, we have uh, one mic here anyway, so maybe we have another one here too, great. So um, I'd just like to ask uh, Catherine if you, as you have the mic there, if you could uh, give us a, a key takeaway that from uh, our, our keynote address. Gladly. Is that on? Is that microphone on? Yes. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. Um, I could probably have drawn a huge mind map to try and respond to all of what was in your keynote, but a few uh, points that I wanted to mention and hopefully um, Others will, will pick up other points. Firstly, I think that uh, the work that you do, Sean, and your colleagues, Jeremy Knox, Jen Ross, uh, Hamish McLeod, and others at Edinburgh, are just a model of critical thinking and generosity. So the work that you did in uh, that first MOOC, the EDC MOOC, um, the Masters in Digital Learning, um, and how you share that, what you learn on an ongoing basis, as well as the artifacts, um, is just enormously, enormously helpful to I think so many of us, so thank you for that. Um, I loved your exploration of the evolution of the manifesto from 2011 to 2016. You can correct me, but my favorite line from the 2011 manifesto was something like, we find we can make eye contact online. And the newer version of that is contact works in multiple ways. And I think that is doing what we all need to do and moving beyond the binaries of online and offline and, and so many other things that you mentioned. And it also creates a space where we can talk about things like openness, the politics of education and openness, ethics, equality, inequality, and so on. So I think it's immensely powerful, um, the manifesto. Um, also, that the work that you do in the manifesto and so much of your other work, I think, as you were speaking, um, highlights the poverty of so much of our language around digital learning. Um, from our anachronistic job titles like lecturer um, to so many other words that we use like online and distance and blended and so on. And language is the substructure of teaching and learning um, and so much of our work around um, trying to create the future of, you know, of our, our institutions of learning. So probably something that we can all take away is just the importance of paying attention and to language and challenging it you know, wherever we find ourselves. Um, because I think that those are the spaces of possibility, like you said, the possibilities, the spaces in between. So I th I'll leave it there, so much more I could say, but thank you so much. Yep, go ahead, Charlotte. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Sean. 
um, it, it's always difficult to follow Catherine because she, she kind of usually nails so many of the thoughts that roll through our minds when, when, when we deal with this kind of material. I'd like to just start again by thanking Shan. I think it was a super paper. It's a really, really good way to start this um, process today. I think it puts out an awful lot of really important ideas. Um, I do agree that what you said about it opening up the space for conversation around issues around ethics and equality is probably the most important part of what you've done today. I think that's very, very important. Um, I love the way you trace the development of the manifesto through its various iterations to the point where it is today. I would not underestimate the influence and the importance of that manifesto. I think anyone who's working in this space over the last few years has rubbed up against it in various ways and taken inspiration and ideas from it. So it's terrific to see it going into another iteration, if you like, taking on another um, uh, sense of direction. Um, Davos. I, I, I kind of, I'm one of those people who bristles when you, when you say the word Davos. And if you add the word Pearson, <laughs> To, to, to the, the Davos connection, then I really start to get a little bit disconcerted and concerned. I think it is profoundly important that these areas are researched. We are seeing the emergence, and this is not, this is not um, a negative comment, we are seeing the emergence of a very, very powerful forces that we've not had to sort of face up to before in relation to um, offering high quality educational experiences um, in, in all worlds, virtual and otherwise, the emergence of this new, it's not quite an economic power, but the, the emergence of this new sort of um, power that could push us towards the sedentarism and, and the, the kind of the instrumentalism is a little bit worrying. And I was delighted to see you citing, particularly from Williamson's work in relation to the politics of uh, algorithms and so on. We need to be doing more work in that space, I think, in research terms. Not a lot of us understand, and I include myself in that, not a lot of us understand the deep implications of those algorithms when they make choices about, you know, and the algorithms do make the choices about what we see, what we don't see, what we're exposed to, what our learning experiences actually are and can be. Um, I like the way that you draw attention to the, the, the complexity that comes with massiveness the massification and the fact that it's not something to be afraid of. I think that th there are wonderful opportunities there for research in those spaces. So yes, we're looking at diagnostic engines, absolutely. Um, and th the notion of the 4% I think is actually changing as well that you mentioned, the, the number of kind of teaching and uh, educational type jobs that, that can and will be affected. That was an early estimate. I think that's changed quite a lot. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, what actually happens in that space over the, the, the coming few years. And my final point, I suppose, would be to thank you for bringing up this wonderful, and, and again, it runs through the manifesto from the beginning, and it runs through so much of the work that's been done in Edinburgh and other places, but this idea that, you know, we are the campus. I think that is, that is a profoundly important message. And for researchers, that's the campus we should be researching not just the bricks and mortar campus, but the, you know, the real campus, the real, the real experiences, the lived experiences of um, students, wherever they may be, whatever they, they you know, construct themselves as. Um, I think that's really it. I, I liked also the way you, you pulled up quite a number of references to Luckland's work, because I find that very, very challenging, um, but not as challenging as, as some of the ideas that you floated for us here today. So thank you very much for that. Hello, um, Sean, again, thanks for a wonderful, thought-provoking presentation. Um, I had read your manif manifesto, um, it was some time ago, but I have to say you very much brought it to life and it was fantastic, you know, to get a real sense of what each element of that ma manifesto offers us. Um, I suppose there were two main areas that uh, resonated with me. And one of them was when you talked about what it means to be a teaching professional, there was a statement there, and I think it's from the manifesto, online teaching should not be downgraded to facilitation. And I suppose a question came to mind, so what form will it take? You know, what, what constitutes online teaching? Um, a colleague of mine, uh, talking generically about how teaching has changed, 
um, talked about the role of a teacher as being a midwife of knowledge. Um, I, I, someone that would ask critical questions and Sugata Mitra in his work in India has also come to similar questions. But I wonder should we perhaps aim for something else? Um, perhaps the role of the educator, whether it's in online or indeed offline, in face-to-face, -face, informal, non-formal, perhaps their role should be more disruptive. That the challenge learners to think, um, sorry, the challenge learners' frames of mind, their mindsets, their frames of reference, um, they get to know and understand what influences learners and think about how to move them beyond their current ways of thinking. And online technologies are perhaps best positioned to do that because there are many opportunities for learners to be ex exposed to multiple perspectives in multiple media formats um, uh, and uh, to help motivate and engage. And the second area that I was delighted to see you um, kind of had a particular emphasis on is the whole area of learning analytics. It's an area, I suppose, that's uh, close to my own interests. Um, and uh, you know, your, crit your cr critique, I suppose, of the current difficulties within learning analytics, particularly um, the nature of the algorithms, algorithms being used, it's understandable why they're being used at present. We're very much at the early stage of understanding how to analyze these multiple forms of data set. Um, you used Latour extensively uh, within your presentation. I wondered perhaps had you considered the work of Deleuze and Qatari and the rhizome as something that might offer inspiration for reconceptualizing um, uh, data analytics or learning analytics. And the final comment I want to make, I suppose, which I felt came through very strongly from your presentation, is the need for a particular type of research that is interdisciplinary. Um, so, one of the problems yeah. is that, you know, within, I suppose, universities, we often work in silos, you know, in our own disciplinary areas. And there are many opportunities there for learning and development and progression of ideas where there are multiple disciplines represented, transdisciplinary, inter-trans uh, disciplinary research. And I'd like to just finish on that point. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like, thanks very much. And uh, just from the feedback coming through the back channels, it's a, it's a wonderful panel and it's uh, uh, great responses. And I think we're really just starting to get the conversation going, which means I'm going to have to stop it. And, uh, but we'll have a, an opportunity for a specially designed session later in the afternoon where we'll get everybody involved and it's going to be very participatory. So, um, and uh, I'd just like to, to thank our panel now and uh, I have a couple more things before we finish up because um, we may be worried about our teacher overlords but we'll never escape time, it's always against us. Um, so, uh, I'd just like to thank our, our panel and our keynote and if they could make their way back to their seats and I'll give them something very briefly as they go by as well.